The false prophet has none of this. But he does have giftings. He is quite a speaker. And he is dynamic. And he seems to have some sort of power about him. But know this. His character is the key. Does he bear fruit? A false prophet is known by two things. The fruit that they bear and the gospel they preach. Galatians chapter 1. And you can just line up many of these TV preachers and just look at the fruit of their life, the way they live, and then look at the gospel that they supposedly preach and you can mark them off as false prophet immediately. Now he says, he says something unusual about them. He says that they are like wolves. Their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. But they look like sheep. Now, how is that? How is it that they look like sheep? By their flattering, smooth speech that in an age of tolerance makes you think that they are the men most full of love. They will never contradict. They will never be, they will never create a scandal. They will never be offensive. They will never speak forth things to anger men. But they have the smooth tongue of a serpent. And they flatter men. And they give carnal men exactly what they want. Now let me tell you something about false teachers. You think so many times that people fall prey to false teachers. And that, in a sense, can be true at times. But I think the dominant theme in Scripture is just the opposite. False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. And you can line them all up along with Him. That's where it is. Because let's go over. Let's just look for a minute at 2 Timothy. Just quickly. Chapter 4. Verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. Now, when He says preach the Word, what does He say? He follows it up with, Be ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, exhort. Notice that that is not what these preachers do. As a matter of fact, they boast in the fact that they do not reprove. They do not rebuke. It's not their ministry. And why do they say it's not their ministry? They have a ministry of love, they say. Well, then are you saying Christ didn't have a ministry of love because he reproved and rebuked and exhorted? And so did Paul. But now look, verse three, for time will come. And this shows you that men are not so much victims of false prophets as false prophets are the judgment of God upon men who don't want God. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who won't? The people, the religious people identified with Christianity. They will not endure sound doctrine. They can't endure it. They hate it. Or it bores them to tears. And so what do they do? But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers. Everybody in this world, I hope you know this, everyone in the world in, that is involved in Christianity knows that America is the birthplace of every heretical teaching on the face of the earth almost. You know what my greatest fear is? My greatest fear is that the wall around Cuba is going to fall. You say, why would you fear that? Because all of the heresy in the evangelical church will find its way into Cuba. I go into countries and some of the times they will tell me this. Go back to your country and tell them, please don't send any more missionaries. Now, what, look, we accumulate for ourselves teachers in accordance 
to their own desires. So you get a Benny Hinn in there who all he wants to do is tell you you're going to have a Mercedes Benz. Those people aren't victims. They're, he is ju God's judgment upon them. They want what he wants. And so they accumulate him to themselves along with all those other teachers because they teach exactly what they want. Do you see that? And why is that? Because a great many people that sit in Christian churches today hate God. You say, what do you mean I hate God? It's like when a, a preacher many times have asked me, would you just please come and teach on the attributes of God? You've written a manual on it. We really like it. Would you come and teach? I go, look, you, you, probably, you probably don't want that. And they go, what, what do you mean? I go, I, I just don't want to divide your church. They go, we're Christian. You're teaching about God. What do you mean divide your church? I said, listen to me, sir. When I start teaching the attributes of God, and not Paul Washer's version, I'll, bring, I'll just bring some historical, systematic theologies and teach out of them. They're all written by Presbyterians. Baptists just don't hardly write anything. <laughs> but I'll bring them, and I'll just read out of them so you know I'm not inventing this stuff, or it's just my idea. And if I preach the classical Christian view of who God is in your church, I said it won't take long for some of your finest members, especially among the elderly and especially among the women, will walk out of that church with their teeth clenched together and say, my God's not that way. I could never love a God like that. Because the God they've been worshiping is not the God of the Bible. It's a figment of their own imagination. A God they made with their mind and then they worship what they made. And he looks more like Santa Claus than he does Yahweh. That's what's going on. The real God. Oh, C.S. Lewis was too tame when he said he's not a tame lion. He's God. And I would not doubt that there are people here and you don't like him. You wouldn't like him if you knew him. Now these false prophets, this is what they do. But know this, they're the judgment of God upon a wicked, defiled people who although they have a knowledge of God, they do not want Him. And so God sends them the teachers that they themselves desire. 